welcome to Practical Talk Time. I'm Sandy Robel, your host for the show again on winemaking in Connecticut. And this is the second episode, part two. And here's a lovely picture that we have of the, um, some of the grapes grown here in Connecticut. And again, I'd like to welcome Amy Naraki. Good to see you again, Sandy. And Eric Lehman, nice to her see husband. They're professors at the University of Bridgeport. And last week we were talking about the history of winemaking in Connecticut, and we decided it would be fun to continue and get up to the modern day and what the state of winemaking is in Connecticut. We touched a little bit about it at the end of the last show. And um, so where are we? Is it growing? Is it diminishing? Do you like Connecticut wines? <laughs> <laughs> well, we obviously yes, love yes it. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Um, I guess we should talk a little bit about what happened right after 1978 when the Farm Winery Act went through. And uh, there were just a few wi winemakers at that time. Um, we had uh, Haight Winery we talked about last time um, in, in Litchfield, and uh -huh. Hopkins and DeGrazia. And they really started this process. Um, and other people took it up. And we had people in the 1980s like uh, uh, Stonington. Stonington. Um, Nick Smith at, at Stonington um, took it up, and, and some other wineries took it up in the 80s, which aren't around today. They've already gone the way of the dinosaur, and other wineries have taken over. Um, but it has slowly grown every year um, from just a few at the beginning, and now there's uh, close to 35, I think, now. Yeah, it's hard to, to tell. Up through the early 80s, there was about a steady of maybe five and a couple. Oh as Eric said, didn't make it, and then some that, are, that were early on are still around. And then it started to pick up a couple here and there every year, adding maybe one or two. Mm -hmm. And really between, I would say around 2000, um, right around the it turn almost, of the almost doubled, um, and then been adding ever since. I think that I've also read that wine drinking in the United States is now overtaking beer drinking, which it I was is. very mm. surprised mm -hmm. at. So I think, yeah, a trend like that yes. certainly helps. I was never in, uh, cared for beer much, but yeah. overall, and I was really, really surprised yeah. to see that. So maybe Connecticut could become a leader? It, it could be. Yeah. There, there are, um, wine, there's been wine being made in every state now, including Alaska. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> where? Southeastern Alaska uh, or where? I'm sure it's southeastern down like near Sitka, Juneau. Juneau yeah. and... But um, there's, a, there's a huge movement, and it's not just Connecticut. Other states are also expanding. More wineries are being are showing up every day in Texas and in Georgia. Right. Now they have to have different kinds of grapes, and they have to, you know, have stuff that's good for uh -huh. their climate, um, just like we do here in Connecticut. But um, I think that's part of why people are are drinking more wine because it's around them. It's everywhere. We're not just getting it from California and from France anymore. We can get it from right in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Well, even California didn't really take off until the late 70s. And so they ha they're about maybe 20 years ahead of us in terms of developing um, grape growing um, practices that are good, deciding which grapes are going to work in their region. And, and then other places that have been influential on Connecticut's growth have been um, the Finger Lakes region of New York, New York. State. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pioneers in that area really started to develop grapes that were better suited to this type of climate. Uh, a little shorter on the summer and certainly colder in the winter. Um, also the Long Fork, the Long Fork of Long Island it has a very um, well established at this point wine making uh, and wine growing. Um, They're about 10 years ahead of us yeah. on, on Long Island. And they could grow Merlot there in fact. Um, and uh, some of our coastal wineries have, have tried that because it's, you know, you can see the wineries across the way that are growing real low. But um, they, uh, but we're slow, we're quickly catching up to Long Island. We've, I think, passed Long Island now for the number of wineries. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's just exciting to uh, to see it happen right before our eyes like this. Do they ever have wine festivals where all the states would go? Well, they certainly have, uh, in, um, contests and things like that where you can submit and people from all over the country submit. Uh, in Connecticut we have the wine festival in July where many of the wineries participate and it's a place for people to come and try wine and there's food booths and you know music so that's it's a fun fun time to check it out if you're unfamiliar with it. Is it held the same 
area. It's usually held in Goshen every year. Yeah, the, you know, uh -huh. Goshen Fairgrounds. At the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a, a shoreline wine festival, which some of the ones from the southeast part of the state um, usually participate in. The, the best places to grow wine in Connecticut are either up in the hills, you, you have to be on a hill on a south facing slope, mm -hmm. or right by the coast. Mm -hmm. um, For the sunlight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also the, the influence of the, the ocean has um, helps this, the winters not be as cold and the summers not be as hot. Yes. Um, but the, the, that helps too. Yeah, even even in the winter, they generally have yeah. less snow, right. or right. even if they have more, it melts right. quicker. And I think a little longer period of growth too. Like the flowers will be out two mm -hmm. weeks prior to ours. That's right. And that certainly season. helps some grapes um, who need a little bit longer on the growing season, particularly reds, to get the full full um, sugars of the red grape. Um, you need longer seasons and more direct sunlight. So, do you like red wine better or white wine? <laughs> I like you know, all <laughs> a couple years ago, I might have said I'm, I'm more of a red wine drinker, but I think now I just, I like good wine. I, and it depends sometimes on my mood, sometimes what I'm doing, um, but I'm, I'm willing to try pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I noticed too, even I, I like Cabernet Sauvignon, which is not a Connecticut wine, mm -hmm. but even with that, it depends, I guess, on the brand and the year, mm -hmm. because even though I say mm -hmm. I like it, there's some I like a lot better than sure. others. Sure. Absolutely. And, and that's one thing we tried to stress in the book. Find the wine that you like. And it mm -hmm. might not be the wine that you're told to like. I right. was, I grew up with, the, my father was a Cabernet Sauvignon drinker, and so I thought that was the end-all and be-all of wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I can understand why people like it, but I found that I didn't like that as much as say a Cabernet Franc from Connecticut or some of the lighter reds, um, Merlots. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's really a, a process uh, and we encourage people mm -hmm. in the book to go out and taste and this is something we can do so well because the vi vineyards are right near us yes. so we can go yeah. we can do a tasting and taste six wines at once and then we start to learn what our palate is and start to learn mm -hmm. what our taste in wine is. It's It's much better than going to the to the wine store, some wine stores have tastings, which you should always go to, because you don't want to just go and buy wine just because it has a pretty label or something. I've done that. Right? Yeah, we all have. <laughs> but but you, you try to avoid that because you might not like it, and you might just, right. you know, you want to find what you like. And I, I found that I really liked um, the whites that in the southeast part of Connecticut that we're producing there. And, and then uh, we found out from the winemakers when we were interviewing them that they have some of the same climate and minerals of Chablis in France. Mm -hmm. So we tried Chablis wine from France. I love it. Love it. That's the wine I like mm -hmm. now, that kind of white um, mm -hmm. white grape wine, uh, Chardonnay. Yeah. You know, Merlot became, has become very popular. And then I said, oh, I didn't like it. I had some, I didn't like it. But then I had some that I loved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning that you can't just say a particular right. grape type. That's right too. Yeah. They, there's a wide variety of, of the way they taste. One of the things that's helped um, certainly Connecticut um, improve is that winemakers are not only figuring out what grapes are going to do well here, but also figuring out how to grow them in, in this climate. And you'll find winemakers who are blending wine, blending different grapes in, a, in an interesting way. So it may be um, a wine that has some Merlot, with some other grapes, like a Cabernet Franc, or we've and, um, been learning about two grapes that were developed in Germany. Um, Dornfelder is one of them, and we've never we've never heard of these. But they they actually are better suited for Connecticut's climates. They're red grapes, mm -hmm. but they do a little bit better than say a Cabernet Sauvignon, which needs a longer growing period. So you might not go into a wine shop and ask for a Dornfelder um, and there probably Unless isn't... Unless you lived in Germany, which... <laughs> yeah, you couldn't, you might even, not even be able to find it by name, mm -hmm. um, but to know that it's a type of grape that actually does well in blending, does well in this climate, um, and talking to local winemakers who know about this, they can turn you on to something like that, um, which is it's just helpful too. Speaking of the blended wines, I thought that um, if it was a blended wine, it wasn't a, as high quality, and then mm. I've heard mm -hmm. that's not true. What is what is the well, truth some of about the, it? Some of the best wines in the world are Bordeaux, and Bordeaux are blended wines. They're either they're they're a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc, which we grow here in Connecticut. So um, some of them 
blend one or the other or whatever. But, you know, a Lafitte Rothschild is a blend of those grapes. So um, that's considered one of, you know, top wines in the world. So it really depends on, um, there was a big movement uh, in America, of course, be selling wine by the grape. You know, a Chardonnay, a California right. Chardonnay. Yes. Um, uh, that's been changing recently. Um, but we have a slightly different categorization system than, mm -hmm. say, France, where wines are named for their region, like Bordeaux. But mm -hmm. they've been blending wines in France, and especially in Italy, uh, for, for hundreds of years. So, Isn't it like Champagne is really a sparkling wine, but Champagne just comes from the region of Champagne? That's exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. I used to wonder what was the difference between champagne and sparkling wine. <laughs> I thought well, I just Where it don't comes from. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I and I you know, to me they seem very similar and I thought there was and supposed they probably to be a difference. Are, right? Yeah. yeah. You used to be able to get a California called a Chablis, which was uh, a very low quality wine and, and but it was just they were taking the name from the region, the region of France. It made no sense to be on an American bottle of wine, uh -huh. something called Chablis. It right. was, it's yeah. not, it, that makes no sense. What is Chablis? Well, it's a region. It's not a type of grape or anything. Yeah. It's just that people recognize that name, and so they go to the store. Oh, I'll get a Chablis. Well, yes, from, yes, yeah, I can understand know, doing Mendocino, that. Mendocino, California, you know. <laughs> yeah. And we start to notice, you know, we can go and ask for a Chardonnay or a Merlot, or um, so we become familiar with the, the name of the wine by the name of the grape. But if you go to Europe or even, uh, you know. France or Italy, they're not naming it by grape necessarily. So our perspective in America is a little different. So we, when you think about um, a wine, you, you maybe aren't realizing that it might have a blend of different grapes in there because it's mainly Merlot, so that's what you see on the label. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, even when, yeah, most states have, well, all the states have different rules, but um, um, if you get a Merlot from, you know, let's keep using, picking on California, um, if you get a Merlot from California, it might have 75% Merlot in it, but it might have 25% of other stuff. Um, it depends on the state law. Mm -hmm. Our laws here in Connecticut are actually quite strict. Um, and so uh, you usually are getting what you are being advertised for, but um, it's not as strict in some other places. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I know that um, I was at a restaurant a couple of years ago in Massachusetts, Greek restaurant, and there was a Greek wine I ordered and I loved it. So I asked the waitress, for the name, and she gave it to me. First, she thought she could sell it to me, <laughs> which I know you can't in Connecticut. So yeah, I said, yeah. fine. I thought, well, Massachusetts has a different law. Uh -huh. But it was the same. I couldn't right. buy the bottle of wine in the restaurant. Yeah. Mm. And then I came home, and um, I went to a, a wine store in Aston. They looked it up, and I finally went back, and they said, it's not allowed to be sold in Connecticut. <laughs> well, yeah. that's, what is yeah. the, why, why does the state do that? What is the reason? Yeah, there are different, every, be, Part of this is one of the after effects of prohibition, but mm -hmm. all the states have not only all the countries have different rules, and then all the states have different rules about what you can import and you know which states you can send across you know wines across state lines mm -hmm. from. It's really a mess, um, you know. It actually hurts the industry when yeah. you can't when a winery that is dependent in, in many cases on sales, direct sales, um, when they can't ship out of state or in state and it, it often has to do with what the rule for the other state is. You know, whether Connecticut can ship to Texas depends on whether Texas will accept shipments from Connecticut. Uh -huh. So it, it's a it's a big old mess in terms yeah. of the laws and the restrictions. And so if politicians were smart, they would get together and allow think, more of yeah. it? I think Probably. So. I mean, it's I getting so. better. Um, more and more states are allowing inter, interstate commerce, um, even with wine. So it does take politicians to help us out and with the laws. So if you're going to visit someone in another state, they might really appreciate a Connecticut wine because they wouldn't be able to buy it where they are. Possibly, yeah. That's right. Well, Absolutely. certainly, you uh, you know, we sometimes even have trouble finding Connecticut wines in, in Connecticut liquor stores because their, their shelves are filled with California or Australian or Spanish wines. Um, so sometimes we have to ask for it. Right, I don't think I've seen too many um, Connecticut wines. Depends on the store and what their philosophy is and who their distributor is and all that stuff. It also depends on whether uh, people are asking for it because uh, you're not going to stock it if nobody's going to buy it. So right. 
one thing we hope to do is encourage people to start asking for Connecticut wine, and that'll help your local stores get it. It also helps if you go to a restaurant, a few restaurants around the state, and more and more incorporating Connecticut wines into their uh, menus. But uh, you know, if we can ha have people ask for it, then maybe both mm -hmm. liquor stores and restaurants will start filling their, those requests. So do the winemakers have lobbyists? For, Interestingly, for the state or in some cases, um, very on a very small scale. Yeah. But yeah, we, we know of a for years of uh, at the beginning of this whole process back in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, Bill Hopkins and Sherman Haight did it themselves, and they just went, they would get in a car and get drive up to to uh -huh. Hartford and and sort of lobby the the people themselves, and so. Uh, I, I think they try to get somebody else to do it for them now. Uh -huh. but. Bring them a little sample of the wine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right. Um, what about somebody that would decide, oh, I want to begin a winery? Mm. Um, I don't think it would be possible, would it, in one year to say, well, I'm going to put some grapes in and grow them and sell the wine? Take a couple years. Not in one year, no. Um, no. There's a variety of people who, who start up wineries in Connecticut. Um, the most successful are usually farmers who already have the land. Good point, yeah. um, so they have land if they have south facing hills um, or even east or west facing hills. No problem. Um, you can grow grapes on there and so more and more um, farmers are simply getting rid of whatever their other crop was and putting in grapes. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie Jones at, at Jones Farm in Shelton did that. Um, they, uh, they're rotating their crops and they have a great hill. It's actually both close to the Long Island Sound and a big hill, so they've got the best of both worlds, and they're growing some great, some great grapes that are and making great wine there. And they're a well-established family farm and have been in operation for almost is it 150 years at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. So they have the tradition of, of farming in their family. Um, luckily for Jamie, who's the fifth or sixth generation, uh, he went to school up in Cornell, learned about winemaking, and came back to his family and said, "Hey." What do you think about this? Uh -huh. Let's give it a try, and they were welcoming to that. So, um, and he's really taken taken that off, and um, developed it. And they're probably one, if not the best wineries in the state. Um, now, if you want to make a winery, Sandra, then uh, <laughs> you you'd have to have a lot of money because a you have to buy the land, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then b you have to invest in all the equipment and all the things that right. you need to make good mm -hmm. wine. Um, there are certainly people who have done that in the state um, who, have, who have made, uh, you know, the, the old joke goes, how do you make a for how do you make a small fortune with a winery? And they say, start with a large for fortune, <laughs> right? <laughs> because uh, yeah. it, it, it really uh, takes a lot um, to become successful that way. But for some people, it's their passion and they want to do that. And that's great. Go out and, and do something that you love with your money. Mm -hmm. It would have to be to, to, to grow anything, whether it's vegetables or right. wine. It has to be a passion. Oh, it's absolutely. hard work. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. hard work. And it's well, not a hobby for the weekend. And no. that's one of the things we wanted to really communicate to people through the book is these are farmers. They're working the land and they're growing a, a you know, a farm product. And we, we look at glass and the wine and we think how, how sophisticated, how beautiful it is, but it takes a lot of work to get there. And um, it's, it's not an easy thing. And it's not something that if, if you, you just think of as a hobby, there are ways to do it as a hobby. A lot of people, um, you can make wine in your garage with your family um, in small batches. And, but to, to undertake the big production of a, of a winery and mm -hmm. winemaking, um, can be done. It's been done and continues to be done, but it's it's a uh, it's hard work. Yeah. I would hate to see that a lot of it would turn into housing developments. Oh, yeah. We've lost a lot. Mm -hmm. I know when I was growing up in Danbury, you know, outside yeah. of the city limits, you would see a, a great number of farms. I don't know how many we have now. Probably maybe only two or three of yeah. that. Um, well, this is a way to keep those farms in their in your family. I mean, if you already own the land, that's the biggest expense. So. Um, you know, Jamie Jones at, uh, at Jones Farm was talking to us, and he said we could have made millions of dollars and sold our farm out for for yes. condominiums. He said we could have been multi multi millionaires, um, but they didn't do it. They wanted to keep that farm in their family and and continue the tradition. and And his children now are learning the farm, and and they're going to hopefully do the same. That's really wonderful because it's not yeah. they're not greedy people, which mm. is a large yeah. problem 
in our country today, Definitely. all the problems we're facing. Absolutely. Had right. to do with too much greed. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of times with wine, there's also cheese. Mm. <laughs> now, what about cheese making in the state? Is that becoming popular? Absolutely. Or? We have a bunch of artisanal cheese makers uh, throughout the state. Yeah. Um, some farms like uh, Cato Corner Farm is one of them. Um, we, we talk about some of those in this book, and we're going to be talking about them again in our next book, The History of Connecticut Food. Do you think you'll have a cheese trail? Uh, that would be great. I think there's a, uh, I know a, an interest in that kind of thing. Um, and I th there probably b would be enough to at least have some people on the trail that you could visit. Some uh -huh. farms you can go and you can visit the farm. Others uh, will make their cheese and then you know, sell it to local um, restaurants, local wine shops or cheese shops rather. Um, we, but found, that's we found that the, uh, in our, we haven't completed our research for history of Connecticut food yet, but we found that their cheese making in Connecticut was very popular. Mm. I believe it was at the end of the 1800s. It was huge. And, uh, and I hope it will be again because that's something that we can do here in Connecticut. Small farm artisanal cheese making, mm -hmm. just like small batch wine making. Uh -huh. uh, it's something we can do. We can't, we can't have giant herds of, of cattle here in Connecticut. Um, we don't have as much space as Texas or, or right. Kansas. Or, <clears throat> so um, that's one thing that we can really do, come up with products that work well here and, 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 uh, and promote them and, and make sure that we have cheese trails and wine trails. And, and I never heard of a cheese trail. I just thought maybe it'd be... I think, I think it's have a great one idea. in Vermont. Uh -huh. I'm almost positive they have a Vermont cheese trail, so we should have one here. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. A couple of years ago, I went to a fair in Rhinebeck with uh, relatives from Massachusetts, and we bought some of the um, goat cheese mm. that was made by farmers. It mm -hmm. was really, really tasty. Mm -hmm. Much different than just going to the grocery store. Right. Oh, yes. A different flavor. and. Um, I like supporting small farmers or small businessmen. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one thing that we focused on again in the book. And, you know, not only should you be getting to know your backyard and your home, but you should be supporting uh, your local uh, economy by buying Connecticut wine and, and, and doing that, you know. Um, why not? Uh, especially if you decide, like we did, that you like that wine even better mm -hmm. um, than wines that you're getting from Argentina or Australia. Mm -hmm. It's a way to support local economy, and the, the best way to keep it going is to visit and taste and buy local products. Yeah. So besides being English professors, you could also be kind of economic professors as well. <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, we know a, that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just maybe make, you could collaborate with an economics <laughs> uh, professor. Oh, it that makes sounds sense. Good. Yeah. The fascinating. I, I really, really enjoyed the program when I went to Newtown, it was an eye-opener mm. because I thought it was just modern day that we had winemaking in, in Connecticut. I didn't think that we had a history of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really great. And now um, people are doing tons of different kinds of things. Dr. DeGrazia right down the road here is, is doing organic wines and um, he's doing a lot of interesting like fruit wines. He has one called Autumn Spice, which is honey and uh, what else is in there? It does have some grape wine, but he uses honey and um, you know pumpkin wine and things like that. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah and, and we, White Silo up in Sherman specializes in fruit wine. They have some rhubarb wine there, which right. you would not know is rhubarb wine. It tastes just like a white. Um, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, people are trying, of course, continuing to experiment in small batches to con and. They've, they've started to figure out what grapes grow well in Connecticut, but mm -hmm. who knows, there could be other ones that they're just experimenting with right now. And you're talking about a pumpkin line. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, I'm not sure his method or his secret recipe, but um, it's, it's fascinating. He also works a lot with um, blueberries, uh, blueberry wine, because they're uh -huh. very high uh, antioxidants. And being a doctor, he's very interested in health. Right. So you'll see that a across the state in, in many different um, experimentation, but also looking to see what, what can do well over the long term. Yeah. Our idea that we can just have wine out of grapes is actually a pretty modern idea. That's only mm -hmm. been since the mid-20th century. Before that, in, in the 1800s or in colonial times, you made wine out of everything, out of whatever you had. You made mm -hmm. some sort of alcoholic beverage. Either you fermented it or <laughs> distilled it or, or you, you, know, you would make whatever was on hand, whether it was pumpkin or rhubarb or whatever. 
um, you would make an alcoholic beverage out of that. Um, when I was young, um, too young to drink the wine, Gonzowski's Farm, my, my parents were friends with them, and they made dandelion yeah. wine. Because I think oh, yes. I told you in New Town, yeah. yeah. a young one. son went down the basement, and uh, he was too young too, but I guess he got drunk by sipping Oops. the wine um, <laughs> on his own. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's a very sweet wine. So what does it make take to have... Um, like a dandelion is a flower. Mm -hmm. So what, do you know what kind of process they go through? Or I would imagine you'd have to um, probably boil it and get the essence of the... Yeah, the well, you crush it like crush you do it. with grapes. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a similar process for all these, uh, you know, mm. whether it's a dandelion or whether it's a strawberry or a grape mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, uh, we, we describe the process quite extensively in, in the book and how how these for especially connect for grapes um, but we talk we have a chapter on fruit wine and, and talk about how they they do that and mm -hmm. uh, we, we witnessed a lot of different um, fascinating processes when we went around the state and you know yeah. they're crushing blackberries and they're doing all kinds of fun yeah, things. I like dandelions I have a friend that makes sure she kills them all but you know, <laughs> there could be a lot of money pick to em, be made. Pick them make your own wine. Money to them. be made in our right. weeds and that mm -hmm. people are killing we really should be using them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I also want to tell our audience that Amy Naraki is also a poet and um, another time she's going to be back and we'll talk about we'll do a poetry talk and I did buy a couple of them because one is about babka, and that was something my family always had at Easter time. Mm -hmm. And um, not only that poem, but all of them I really enjoyed with the feeling. And we're going to be ending the program with um, the very first page, really, just before the, the uh, winemaking begins, before the prologue. Amy has written a poem, and she's going to read it for us. Okay, and we'll be ending with Amy reading the poem for us. Follow me back to the vineyard, back to the slopes of distant suns when goat herders and pharaohs tasted the first ripe grapes, full with the day's breath. Follow me to ancient altars, to fire kiln jugs, to weddings under grand trumpeting tents. Follow me across the foreboding sea, to new soil, through grafted roots, down into the wellspring and up again, into the heavy red of sugared globes. Sip as we gather, clustered around the fireplace, laughing in the bud of evening light, sharing the extract of conversions, sun and soil, water and time. Raise your glasses toward the moon, the approaching suns, the human song held sweet in the memory of wine, and follow me, friends into the moment, our mouths curving into the crescent of a smile.